Nicole and I were watching um, this week, and we saw an amazing video, and it was a video of a, of a kind of a worship service for a pretty large church, and it had to have been, what well, was a Coliseum, so that's what, 10,000-ish people? And then it was quite impressive. There was all of the humans in this Coliseum, and down there about where the 50-yard line would be, there was the stage, and boy, were the performers talented, and they surely were. And the songs, powerful, powerful. They had the smoke machines and the lights all going, you know, and how many of you love to be in a raucous environment like that? I know I do. But if we're not careful, as the camera panned the people, many of the eyes were closed and hands are raised. Praise God for that. But is there the possibility that every single one of those people in that powerful time of worship were all of them truly saved, born again? You've probably encountered it there in the Gospel of John. I will say to some on Judgment Day, depart from me. I never knew you. I hope that when you encountered that, perhaps a little bit he went, oh, is that me? Well, the answer is in Gospel of John chapter 10, right about verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they, they follow me. There's how you know. So that whole sort of worship time, and if you can call them up on YouTube, they're there as well. And Yes, it is wonderful to passionately pour out your heart to the God who resides within you. But this message today here in Acts chapter 8 is for a fellow by the name of Simon. Simon is going to say the sinner's prayer. Simon is going to get baptized. And I'm perhaps reading into it, but I'll bet Simon was at some of those concerts <laughs> And therefore the whole group moved to tears and feeling the Holy Ghost chill bumps. But is Simon saved? Peter is going to let us know. Chapter 8, real quickly, glorious church, God's glorious church is growing powerful and expanding. Well, then there's the enemy kind of coming against it. We saw in chapter 5, there was the enemy kind of poking at the people inside the church, complaining. And then chapter 6 and 7, we saw Stephen, the enemy coming after the church from the outside, the Pharisees and Sadducees. And now we're going to see what happens uh, as Paul is breathing out his resentments. Chapter 8, verse 1. And now Saul, there's your apostle Paul, but not yet. Remember how chapter 7 ended? There was Stephen, and they took their coats off, so they wanted to stone him, so they were warming up their pitching arms. And the Bible says that they laid their coats at a man's feet, and his name was Saul. Now Saul was consenting to his, Stephen's, death. This word for consenting is made up of two words, son you do eco. And it means to agree, to vote, to consent alongside. Verses like these have many scholars believing that Paul was a voting member of the Sanhedrin. Could be. I don't know. Cruising. Now at that time, a great what? We better say that later. Better say that louder. A great what? Yeah, persecution. Wouldn't it be cool if you said the sinner's prayer, really and truly meant it, laid your whole life in his hands, and then it got better and no more problems after that. How many of you in this room have been saved more than about 33 seconds? Anybody? Yeah. At that time, what happened, you guys? The enemy never leaves it alone. A great persecution arose against the church, which was there in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made a great lamentation. Um, I've wondered about that. Made a great lamentation. I get that. Um, when someone near to us and precious to us is passed on, that's no, it's no picnic. It's not easy. But um, I wonder, you know, kind of what these guys were thinking in terms of if you're truly born again and to leave this lifetime, where are you immediately to follow? In the presence of the Lord. With great lamentation, they really loved Stephen. Verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house 
and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Now think this one through with me. It's one thing to have an intellectual disagreement or a differing of opinion. It's another thing to get so worked up that you get off the sofa, you go to City Hall and you get, I don't know, whatever hoops he had to jump through. He got the legal rights and legal papers. He's going to go house to house and drag Christians away, kicking and screaming. Do you see what, what I'm saying? Is there a certain passion behind the apostle? Well, he's not the apostle Paul yet. But is there a certain passion behind Saul? Yeah. Does that make sense? You know, we're, we're watching, I don't like that guy, flip, flip. I don't like that, dun, 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 dun. I like that guy a lot, that ESPN. There's one thing to kind of have an opinion. Look what Paul, look what Saul is doing. He is active and passionate. Paul is so worked up about the Jews, about Jesus being Messiah, he gets off the sofa and he wrangles with the political system of City Hall and he goes house to house. I wonder if this passion, a little part of it, comes from some sense of the Holy Spirit's conviction. This is just a theory of mine. My grandmother used to say, when you take a rock and you throw it into the chicken coop, most of us don't have a chicken coop, but my grandmother did. When you throw a rock into the chicken coop, it's the chicken that got hit that squawks. Which reminds me, I lost my gum one time in the chicken coop. I thought I found it three times. <laughs> that's an old joke, Mike. Don't, yeah, that's terrible. I, <laughs> that's just, where does this stuff come from? I'm very sorry for that. Here's the point. You may have experienced that when you are trying to walk with the Lord, People around you who aren't, they have a strong opinion of you. I wonder if Paul's passionate response is a little bit because, remember what the Holy Spirit was going to do when he is poured out in second chapter of the book of Acts? He's going to lead us into all truth. That's cool. And he's going to convict us, isn't he? He's going to convict us of sin, what we shouldn't be doing, of righteousness, what we should be doing, and that there is a judgment day. I wonder if people who are the most vociferous, the most outspoken, the most effusive, no, 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 no! I wonder if they're the chicken that got hit by the rock of the Holy Spirit. I just wonder. Have you noticed the passion of some anti-Bible groups and they don't just leave it alone as water cooler banter, they're going and getting elected so that they can change the laws of the land. It's not just that they have their opinion, you have yours. They're doing everything within their power to make you look stupid and to promote their agenda. It's kind of the same thing. I just wonder if it's nothing or something having to do with at some level. Why are you so worked up? I wonder if the Lord has touched something in their heart. Just a thought, verse 4. By the way, we're only going to get to about verse 25, so if you're seeing about the warriors playing this afternoon, you're going to be okay. Verse 4, please. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. When God brings a tough time to your life, and sometimes he's moving you from complacency to, well, some of the hard work in places that he can. I hate when God does that. Why is he doing that? Look where the gospel's going. Maybe that uh, difficult employer, that, that boss of yours, it just drives you nuts. Some of his passion against you might be because of the Holy Spirit's conviction. And because God has allowed that squeezing, maybe you're supposed to come out of your complacency and you are perhaps one of the only lights in that person's life. In a, in a sense, he's taking you to Samaria, you know, with this guy. Just a thought. Now here comes Philip, verse 5. Then Philip, remember he was one of the first seven deacons, went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Real quickly, who are the Samaritans? When the Assyrians come in 720 B.C., all prophesied by Isaiah and a number of other Old Testament prophets, 
They so defeat the northern ten tribes region. And where was the ten tribes region capital? Where was it? Samaria. The southern two tribes region of, of Judah held out for another hundred or so years and eventually would succumb to the Babylonians. But getting back to that northern ten tribes region area, who the Assyrians and Sennacherib did not kill outright, they took away to be prisoners to Nineveh, and they took them by putting hooks in their jaws. Some filtered, some Jews filtered their way back, either escaped or hid during the first wave, and they begin to rebuild a semblance of a Jewish society there in headquartered in Samaria. But because there was no prophets there, they began to sort of play with God's word. And so one of the things is said, this Mount Gerizim is awesome. You know, Mount Zion is not where Abraham offered Isaac. And it's not where the Ark of Moses was to be placed. That all happened on Mount Gerizim, you see. And they begin to pick and choose their own priests. And so by the time Jesus shows up, and let's go back a little further, um, you go when they're coming back, the, the, uh, the tribes that were taken by the Babylonians, when they come back under, after the exile, they begin to rebuild there on Mount Zion. Well, remember the story of Ezra and Nehemiah and all those? Nehemiah. He's not the shortest man in the Bible, by the way. Bill Dad, the shoe height is. <laughs> Mike, stop it. I don't know why I go there. <laughs> you remember Sand Ballot and those guys? Can we help? Can we help? What did the Jews say? No. Why? Those were Samaritans. Over that long period of time, they had monkeyed with God's word in a sufficient and significant manner. So they also intermarried with many of the Assyrians who were left behind to found colonies. So by the time Ezra and Nehemiah show up, can we help you build? We're all back together. We're all one big family, aren't we? Well, the Jews said, no, you are, well, you're something very different, but you're not, you're not one of us. And what did the Samaritans do? Fine. So then in Samaria, they just went more bolder into their stuff. And then you have this powerful, powerful bigotry. Jews from Jerusalem who thought of themselves as pure Jews. And then the Samaritans who thought they were of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they had a big sort of bigotry, powerful bigotry. That one day then when Jesus says, let me tell you a story. There was a good Samaritan. <laughs> and all the people went, what? You said Samaritan. There are no good Samaritans. Jesus chose that parable on purpose. Remember the gospel story that Jesus says, we got to go through Samaria. And then the boys went, do we have to go through Samaria? Yes, because I have an appointment there, he said. You remember who that appointment was? The woman at the well near the city of Shechem. He's sitting there on the well, and here comes the lady. You know the story. Oh, there's a dude there. The interesting thing was the time of day was late, warm. Why was she the only one there? Because that was the task that was done best in the morning, in the cool of the, the, of the early morning. And then also because it was somewhat of a social affair, all the ladies, of course, would talk and share well, this woman from Samaria, she didn't want to go with that group. Why? Probably because she was pretty sick of them chewing the fat about her. What do you mean? She shows up there, and there's Jesus. Oh, there's a dude there, and she gives him a good look. Oh, he's a Jewish, he was a Jewish fellow from Jerusalem. This ought to be great. You know the story. She rolls up, and he's just sitting there. I wish I had a video of it. I wonder if Jesus is all... And she looks down, and she goes... Uh, you're sitting in a well. Yeah. Where's your bucket? He said, hmm. if you knew who was speaking to you right now, you would ask me for a bucket. What? The water that I can give you, mm, you drink from this well, you will never thirst again. She's all crickets. <whistles> then she kind of huffs, <laughs> give me some of that water. You know the story, they enter into a dialogue. 
She's first to say, you know, we Samaritans, we believe what we believe, and you Jews, you're out to lunch. Jesus sets her straight on really what's supposed to happen. That the Father is seeking such to worship him. Who? Though that worship him, those that worship him in spirit and in truth. So she, he sets her straight. And then he's like, you know, this is such good news. You should go tell your husband. <laughs> what did she say? Yeah, well, about that. I don't have a husband. And then Jesus, word of knowledge, supernatural. You have well said, you've had five. And the one you're living with now, you're not even married to. Inference. You've relied on one man after another who only disappointed you. And now let's just forget the whole marriage thing. I just need to hitch my wagon to someone who will take care of me and perhaps my children. Men. Oy. You've had five husbands and the one you're now living with, you're not even married to. You've given up. I wonder what she looked at. She says, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. <laughs> True story. Do you remember what happens? Well, you know, we're watching for Messiah to show up. We've been waiting. And Mount Gerizim, they had their own hocus pocus and stuff that they did, but they too were looking for a coming Messiah. They shared many of the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus said, without any subterfuge, without any double speak or parables, he said, I am the Messiah. She's all gun. Stay right here. <laughs> she leaves her bucket and she goes back. You know the story. And here they come. And by the sometime by that happened, by the time that happened, the disciples have just gotten back from Walmart and they said, okay, we got burgers, you know. And, and then he says, I'm not hungry, boys. And they're like, not hungry. Does somebody give him something to eat, you know? And then he says, look! And everybody looked and coming up the trail that's still there to this day. Here came all of the Samaritans dressed in their ceremonial white with a white hat. Behold, look, there's the harvest. Can you imagine all those boys from Galilee? They're all Samaritans. By the way, check it out. The only real revival do documented in the New Testament uh, Gospels didn't happen in Jerusalem, you know, the Harvard of all things Jewish. Didn't happen anywhere else. Do you know where the only true citywide revival took place in the New Testament Gospels? In the city of Samaria. So that's the backdrop. Verse number five, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ to them. Please notice the word goes before the miracles. Too many churches have this backwards. The craving experience and the ooh, Holy Ghost chill bumps with little or no Bible teaching at all. And remember that the woman at the well had started this revival, John chapter 4, because of what Jesus taught her. Their hearts are prepared. Watch what happens, verse 6. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the what? Miracles which he did. Verse 7. Unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. I want you to notice something. It's interesting that Jesus in the Gospels, then the apostles, and now Philip, look how often they took authority over some demonic influence. It happened a lot. Is there a correlation? between demonic oppression and physical impairment? Answer, sometimes. Now, I've got to let you know something. Fallen angels are called demons in, the, in your Bible, in the scriptures. As a rule, they hate you with a kind of violence that um, you can really only get a peek of, I believe, in times of gruesome reality television. Some of the footage coming from the Ukraine 
That's what the enemy wants to do to you. He doesn't want to just shoot you in the head with a gun and you fall over. He wants to dismember and tear and rip. Demons hate humans, hate them. Why? Well, because one thing, they have hope. We have hope and they don't. The point of it is, as a rule, God keeps you and I safe from what the demons want to do to us. We're not a kind of a casual pastime that they play in. Did you know that there are demons on assignment over humans, individual people, over families, over entire cities, and sometimes empires? What's their aim? They want to take everything that God wants to do and turn it around, pervert it, make it sound stupid and cruel so that the humans will gravitate to the things that will destroy their lives. As a rule, God keeps you and I safe from what the demons really want to do to you. But sometimes humans go where God says, don't go. We hang with people that God's word says you shouldn't be hanging with them. We touch and entertain things and lifestyles that God says you got to get out of. We continue in those willful, disobedient paths do you know that we are opening the door to demonic shenanigans more and more? It's a true story. I doubt that in most cases a demon has jumped into somebody's body and is manipulating fingers and tongues, but it does happen. And it happens uh, not like you're walking down the street one day, do 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 do, and a demon jumps on you, ah, and then you're Linda Blair. <laughs> Man, these cultural references, I got to get out of that whole thing. That's not how it works. What happens is, is you step into inviting deeper and stronger demonic control of your life, one knowing rebellion after another. And is it possible that some humans have so opened the door that literally demons can use their vocal cords, tongue, lips? Yes. Cole and I, we've seen it firsthand. It's real and it happens. Notice here in Samaria, one more time, verse six. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken of by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles of which he did. Verse seven, well, look at this. Unclean spirits, who is that? Those are demons. Crying with a loud voice, whose voice? The human that they have such complete control of. They came out of many who were possessed and many who are paralyzed, lame, and healed. I'm not saying that all illness is demon-caused, but I wonder how much is and we're treating the wrong illness. What are you talking about? Oh, come on, Pastor Steve. We don't deal with that stuff today. Really? Or have we allowed psychology, really man's wisdom, to shift the attention away from demonic activity too often? No, no, it's just a psychosis, you see. It's a syndrome. It's a dysfunction. It's childhood trauma. I was born this way. Maybe. But how much of it potentially could be broken in a moment's time? If I were to sincerely repent and cry out for God and renounce the devilish and demonic in my life. I want you to notice how often Jesus walked in that experience. So did the apostles. And now check it out in the book of Acts with Philip. Look what happens when these Samaritans receive God's word and they apply God's truth. Watch what happens now when they repent from their sin and close the door to knowing rebellion and demonic oppression. Verse 8. And there was great what? There was great joy in the city. And I'm, I'm being a little bit uh, cantankerous. Because of AA? Because of comprehensive counseling services? How about governmental social services? How about welfare? Dr. Phil. Why was this city enjoying a great joy. It's when sin has been confessed fully and people are learning God's word 
and they're choosing God's word over feelings, God's word and truth over relationships. I can't possibly do that because my good buddy's not gonna come along with me. I wonder, verse nine. But there was a certain man named Simon. Uh, highlight Mr. Simon, if you would. He's gonna tell us and give us a great example. Does everyone who goes to church is moved by the sensing of the presence of God, even to the point of tears. Remember that concert I told you about as the reverse angle would move along the crowd of worshipers. Oh, the passion, hands raised. Are all of those truly born again? The answer is probably not. How is it possible? Let's watch Mr. Simon. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest. This is a famous guy right here. They're saying, this man is great power of God. To the uninitiated, anything super, Supernatural, beyond the natural, meta or beyond the physical, is quite impressive. Um, but um, if there is supernatural power going on here, some demonstration, what's the source? Probably not God. Verse 11. They heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long, long time. Was this a clever sleight of hand or was it actual demonic practices? Hold your finger here. Would you join me in the book of Deuteronomy? I feel obliged, and I have a certain responsibility. i got to show you this. Deuteronomy chapter 18, everybody. If you haven't heard this before, you really do need to see it. It's in your Bible. And those of you who are here only because somebody promised you a breakfast, sorry. You're going to know something, and you're going to be held responsible for it. Look at the person who brought you and said, thanks a lot for that. Chapter 18, please. Book of Deuteronomy, Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and now Deuteronomy. Look at verse number nine. This is Moses. He's about to get the car keys to Joshua. Going to hand them off. They're going to get into the promised land. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, verse nine, you shall not learn to follow the abominations. Please circle that or underscore it. Highlight it perhaps. That's not a casual word. God doesn't really sort of prefer you do these. This is, they are what? Abomination. Do I need to go in something that's unpleasant versus something that is an abomination that makes you wretch a little bit? That's what this word is. These are abominations of those nations. Verse 10, they shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. That was Molech, the god of economy and business. Take one of your babies, put them on a statue that's torso has been hollowed out. They've stoked a fire in it. And that metal idol representing Molech is glowing red hot. Put your baby on that. And they, of course, would scream. And then they would beat the drums. And it was called the Valley of Tophet. Drumming. How awful is that? Is that an abomination? Don't anybody do that. Here in America, are there folks who sometimes will sacrifice their children for their economic purposes and furtherings? It's a, it's a penetrating thought. It's a disturbing sort of notion. But the name of the game is, who do I trust more? God? Or am I going to give up my children? Oh, we got a... a, a some slides are for you. Ready, Chris? I wrote these down just in case you wanted to jot them down. They'll be available on our website. Or one who practices witchcraft. Go ahead. Witchcraft. What is that? Well, that's using occultic practices to predict present or future information. Okay. Who's next? Don't be a soothsayer. What's that? That's casting spells using incantations to manipulate the spirit world. A lot of movies popularize that notion. Say the right hocus pocus word. Um, abracadabra, one of the longest, uh, what is that called, where it's spelled the front and same as the back. Um, I can't think of what that is. I'm not going to do well on Jeopardy when I go, I can tell. <laughs> Anagrams, is that what they call it? Palindrome, thank you. That just occurred to me, palindrome. 
So, um, so it interprets omens. What is interpret omens? That's telling the future by signs, quote unquote, like crystal balls, Ouija boards, and the stars, astrology. Now astronomy is a science and it watches and, and uh, can learn a lot about the moving of the stars and the cosmos. But when you start connecting that to predicting future behavior, you are doing something that the Bible says you are interpreting omens. What does God's word say this is? An abomination. I hope you have heard this before, but if not, if this is the first time, stay away from reading your horoscopes. God says, don't do it. It is an abomination. But I gotta know what my day is going to be like. How about this is the day that the Lord has made. I will what? Rejoice and be <laughs> Doesn't the Bible say acknowledge him in everything that you do? Don't lean to your own understanding, but in all ways acknowledge him and he will what? Guide your steps. You don't need a horoscope for that. Or sorcerer. Here's our boy Simon. Sorcerer. What's that? That's magic by potions, incantations, conscious altering drugs that was a big part, an altered sense of conscience. God has given us all a good quarterback. That is to say, our conscience, the Holy Spirit around us if we're not saved, certainly the Holy Spirit in us when we are saved. He will say, don't go there. Don't do that. But you anesthetize that witness of the Holy Spirit by drugs or alcohol, you become an open door for whom? Demonic suggestion. Some of it's your own knucklehead suggestion. Here, hold my beer. That happens, that never happens. That never works out well. But sometimes that thought that occurs, please harvest, be careful. The Greek equivalent is pharmakia. It's where we're going to get our word pharmaceuticals from. I have yet to encounter someone truly wrestling with drug abuse that didn't also have a strong component of willful disobedience and literally opening up the demonic into their lives. This is our boy Simon here. Who's next? Then we have one who conjures spells that's binding up a person or spirit by magic. And don't be a medium that's speaking for or representing a demon or a spirit. A lot of people do that. They channel Rantham or whatever. Who is he? He's a Sumerian warlord, a 35. How come nobody ever channels Lenny from Sparks? I'm sorry, but I'm, that's one. I'm the Lumerian warlord of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, that's not a former human, is it? Who is it? A demon. Or a spiritist. Wizard says King James. This is having a familiar spirit. This is being possessed. There are literally people that ask for spirits to take over their bodies. God says, stay away from that. Acts chapter 16, we saw that as a spirit of divination. And H, one who calls up the dead. Harvest, please, don't talk to dead people. I'm gonna say that one more time. Jonathan Edwards, his books are hot sellers. Who was the one, Sylvia Brown, with the big long fingernail that she would clatter across her teeth on the Montel Williams show? I think Pastor Steve watched way too much afternoon television. That's what I think happened. She was talking to dead people all the time. Who is uh, Teresa Caputo, a.k.a. the Long Island Medium? Why do you know that? I'm just trying to just say it. These are people that say, I see your mom, your uncle, your brother, your wife standing behind you. And the person is just only too glad Yes, it really, and tears will flow. I don't doubt that Teresa Caputo is connecting with someone, but it is absolutely not a former human. Why? Jesus already told us about that. There is a place in a multidimensional sort of fashion where those, the disembodied spirits of the unrighteous dead, they're collecting before the cross, on the other side, was a place called paradise, um, Abraham's bosom. And the one looks across and sees Abraham, and he says, Father Abraham, 
you got to go tell my brothers still up there about this horrible place. Abraham says, can't, because between you and I, there's a great gulf fixed, and we can not move across it. Once a person has died, their disembodied spirits today are either with the Lord, if you're born again, or they're at this place collecting a holding temporary hell that will ultimately be emptied out on judgment day. They'll get their new bodies as well, fit for eternity, but not with the Lord, light and purpose and power and love, but separated. Don't talk to dead people. It's been a while since I've mentioned this, but uh, there, was a, there was a video that was circulating and it got to my wife's uh, Facebook account. By the way, I don't know how to work face, Facebook. I really don't. So, um, Pastor Steve, come on, get into the whatever century. Do Facebook. I don't think I can. I don't think I have the, uh, the equipment. I don't know. But this particular video came across and it was of a video of a, a church. If I would mention it, you would know it not here in Reno, Nevada, but it's a church, if I mentioned the name, you would know it. And there was a prophet standing on the stage and he says, I see your father. And he says to the pastor of the church and the rest of the church, oh, he sees his father in heaven and he's talking to, and he named a prominent person in the assemblies of God movement and he's talking to him. People, oh, this is awesome, this is awesome. And leaning forward, what do he say? And your father says to tell you, and I went, whoa. And that sanctuary that seats, I don't know, a thousand, maybe more, were cheering and clapping. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What does Deuteronomy 18 say? Don't talk to dead people. But because the congregation at large either didn't know or didn't understand, they thought it was a tremendous blessing. Oh my. It doesn't surprise me that that particular church has some very serious doctrinal insufficiencies. But what touched my heart, both Nicole and I, was the giddiness that the whole crowd was excited. Ooh, the prophet is talking to um, this pastor's father who is dead. And now this pastor is going to get new hot information from the heavenlies. Oh, they're going to get some hot information. All right. Let's keep cruising. Verse 12. I wanted to read that because I want to be absolutely clear. God says, stay away from these things, harvest. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And then Simon himself, what? He what? Believe. Well, he's in. He probably said the sinner's prayer. And when he was what? Baptized? He continued with Philip and was amazed. Let me rephrase that. Oh, and the Holy Spirit is moving. I want to be in the same room. I want to feel those Holy Ghost chill bumps. He was amazed seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. Is Simon saved? Right in your margin here, James 2, verse 19. And that says, James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, you know what? Demons believe they have to. They see it. But they're not saved. They believed and they believe and tremble. He got baptized. He said the sinner's prayer. He's probably singing the same worship songs. He's on the video. Worshiping and praising. But is he truly born again? Let me show you another conversion, if you wouldn't mind. Hold your finger here. Now let's go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel 24. Let me show you about another conversion. 1 Samuel chapter 24. Look down at verse number 15. 1 Samuel 24. I'll get there any month now. 1 Samuel, oh my goodness, chapter 24. I wish we had the Jeopardy, final Jeopardy music theme playing right now. Thank you, everybody. You're awesome. <laughs> Are you there? Chapter 24, 1 Samuel. Look down there to verse number 15, if you would. What's happened? Uh, Saul is after David. Why? Because he's jealous. 
Samuel the prophet's already said, Saul, you're done, pal, and give the kingdom to King David. What did Saul say? Uh-uh, it's mine. Oh, really, says the prophet. David has to split, cut and run, and Saul comes after him. And then there's an incident where David's men are hiding in this cave near En Gedi, and Simon comes in either to take a nap or to take care of some business. And while he's kind of indisposed, his men are whispering, God brought Saul to you to kill him. David, wonderful teaching moment here. No. God brought Saul not for me to kill him. He brought Saul in to teach all you watching me, the one day king, how God really works things. He snips off a little bit of the hem of Saul's garment where most people wore the epilepsy of authority and then he heads on out. David and his men file out of the cave and they're in some place, read that out of bow shot, and he yells down, hey, Saul, you know, and Saul turns around, David, swing, pulls out his sword. Are you missing something from your robe? Checks himself over, he sees a piece missing from his hem. Yeah, David, does it look like this? Saul, gulp, and he puts it all together. David could have killed him, but didn't. Verse 15, Saul then repents, apparently. He says, verse 15, Therefore let the Lord be judge and judge between you and me and see and plead my cause and deliver me out of your hand. Verse 16, So it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul that Saul said, Is this your voice, my what? My son? What was he even doing out there? Running David down. My son? And Saul lifted up his voice and say it with me. Just because somebody has big crocodile tears, I'm so sorry. Does it necessarily mean they have repented? Watch what happens. Then he said to David, you are righteous than I. More righteous than I. I, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I rewarded you with evil. Skip down to verse 20. And now I know. Indeed, that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hands. Now that's correct theology. Keep reading. What happens to Saul in about 23 seconds? He's going to change his mind and he's going to go right back to persecuting David. He had crocodile tears. He said and quoted the right theology but was he truly born again? No, he wasn't. Back to the book of Acts, please. Acts chapter 8. I'm aware of eight times in the Bible where people said the words, quote, I have sinned. Let me read them off to you quickly. Well, you had King Saul, we just read. Did you know that Pharaoh said the same thing in Exodus 9, verse 27? So did Balaam. You know who Balaam is, right? He's an awful, supernatural, false prophet guy. And in Numbers chapter 22, verse 34, Balaam says, I have sinned against God. Do you know how Balaam died? Balaam died by fighting against Israel with Israel's enemy, their army. That's how he died. Then you have Judas, who also said the same thing in Matthew 27. I have sinned. And then Achan, remember in the Old Testament book of Joshua, I have sinned. Do you remember what happened to him? He was killed. And his family. They said the right words, but what was their fruit? Remorse. I'm so sorry. They're remorseful that they got caught. And now they're feeling the pinch. Here's a couple others. King David says it in 2 Samuel 13. What was his fruit? He changed. The prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, verse 18, says, I have sinned against my father. He changed. Harvest, it's so crucial and so important. Have you truly given your heart to the Lord? How do I know I have? Um, you know, we're done with Acts. I was going to try to get further, but I want to end here, if you wouldn't mind. Would you join me now in the book of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I want to get this one right. 
2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians 7. There we go. There, in the church today, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly common practice. How many of you want Jesus? Well, then let me see your hands. I want Jesus. You know he loves you and has a plan for your life. That is absolutely true. But be careful. The Simon in all of us, that little lawyer that lives inside of everyone, that hands on hips, no, you know. I have a right. God loves you and has a plan for your life. And then that little lawyer says, this is awesome because I love me too. And I have a wonderful plan for my life as well. All I got to do is put a little Jesus on it, like butter on the toast, Jesify myself. Is that even a word? Jesusify my life. And churches in the Laodicean era are making it only too easy. Because after all, many of them, their stated aim is to get as many humans packed into the building as we can. Number one, that was never Jesus' methodology. I'm thinking of a couple of occasions, I'm, I'm in. Really? Well, sell everything you have and go give it to the poor. He said to that guy, nobody else. He said it to him. What did, the guy, what did that guy do? Uh, off he went. Jesus, he was rich. He would have been a great tither. But Jesus knew that that guy had a button he was never, ever going to get rid of. He did not include, though he was seeker-friendly, remember, keep the commandments. Oh, these I have done since I was a youth. I'm a seeker. Are you seeker-friendly, Jesus? To this particular person, he said, here's your button. Get rid of your button, and then you will have the right heart. But that man went away sad because he had great wealth. It is the stated aim of the Laodicean church age. Let's pack as many humans as we can in the building. That's not the methodology of Jesus. And look at Simon. Remember the video camera panning the Colosseum of passionate people? Saul was passionate too. Look at them, their their eyes are closed, there's tears running down their cheeks, hands are raised, surely they're saved. They got baptized, they said the sinner's prayer. And if any pastor says, because you raised your hand and said the prayer, you're locked in automatically, whoa, hold on. I just showed you eight people in the Bible that said I have sinned, and I believe we'll see only two of them in heaven. Just because you said the magic words, the name of the game, really and truly, have you repented for your sin? That's the key. Well, what is repentance there, Mr. Smarty Pants, Pastor Steve? Are you in 2 Corinthians chapter 7? Look there to verse number 9. In 1 Corinthians, Paul had to correct them. They were entertaining a fellow who was living with his father's wife. Yeah, go ahead and say it. Ew. But in the the Corinthian church, they said, we're so full of grace, you know. And I don't know what the pastor there was preaching, but at any point did the pastor dare to teach about what true marriage and fidelity looks like and what sexual sin really is not just a, oh, it's just something that everybody does, Or a sexual sin, adultery and fornication, pornea is the word for fornication. We just something that we do. Please understand something. If the church is not teaching you verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, you may never hear. Don't sleep with your father's wife. You'd think that would be somewhat intuitive. So they wrote that. And then here is um, Paul's follow-up. Verse 9 Chapter 7, 2 Corinthians. Paul says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to, what is that word? Repentance. Please circle that. Remember, uh, remorse is one thing. Uh, That was Judas. What have I done? I have betrayed the Messiah. He was not repentant. He was remorseful. How do you know the difference? I have a handy sort of reference. I don't know, maybe it will help you. If it's remorse, I get, I'm sorry I got caught. I have to pay the fine. I have to spend a little time in jail, whatever it might be. Um, but when nobody's looking, I'll probably do it again. 
That's remorse. He said, I'm, I'm, um, I rejoice not that you were made sorry. I didn't want to really put a bummer on you, but what I'm glad is about is that your sorrow led to repentance. Some stuff changed. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us and nothing. It was really, really, really hard to send that first letter from Paul, but hearing how many of you listened and are now walking closer to God, I'm glad I did it. A good place to write here, Proverbs 27, verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance. This is the, this is the thing. This is not what um, Simon did. Godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Oh, please hear this one. Remorse that doesn't change you only sets you up to be more emboldened to go further into that sin the next time. And what will that train, where will that train always take you? To destruction, even death. Verse 11 for observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, and here it comes. What diligence it produced in you. That's the root word, haste, spuda. I'll waste no time. I'll let nothing get in my way to do whatever it takes to make this right. Husbands and wives, this is going to hit a little close to home. Husband looks at wife, or wife looks at husband, and they're kind of giving you that nonverbal kind of, hmm. Now, they're not saying anything, but is that communication nonetheless, you know? Honey, is there something wrong you don't know? No? Well, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. Don't play that game. The name of the game is, this is what I saw, this is what I heard, and this is what I felt. And the person who is hearing that, that's not easy. I get it. And that lawyer wants to jump up and say, no. Are you willing to hear what the spouse has said and do whatever it takes that they won't feel that again? Sorry, you know. S-A-W-R-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E. Sorry. Is that what this is talking about? That's not the word. Diligence. I'll waste no time. I will let nothing get in my way to do whatever it takes to correct this. What clearing of yourselves. That's your Greek word apologia, and it means a reasoned statement. I now realize exactly what I did and why it was wrong. Therefore, from this moment on, no more excuses. Sorry, you know. I said I was sorry. But are you willing to clear yourself? not make excuses. Are you willing to say, tell me again what I said and what I did? Are you interested in learning why that hurt that person of yours? Do you understand what you're saying you're sorry for? What indignation, that's the Greek word agantesis, agdang, agantesis. I'm not a Greek guy. It's all Greek to me, as a matter of fact. But it basically means agan, which means much or overwhelming. Ketesis means to bend. In other words, I am overwhelmed and nearly incapacitated by what my sin has cost you. That's what the word means. Sorry versus when you really get it, oh my goodness, what I have caused this person. But in the context of Mr. Simon in the book of Acts, does he really know what he has done to God? What fear, that's the Greek word phobos, and it means dread, terror. Do I absolutely have a fear of a righteous God? Now, I'm treading lightly because I know that many of us, well, well let me kind of water that down a little bit. It means a deep reverence, yes. But this word for fear is phobos. It's where we're going to get our word phobia. I think it's largely missing in the church of Laodicea in these last days. The church 
culture that will be largely in effect right before Jesus comes, that people will think their sin is no big deal. Is there any sense that one day you are going to stand before the holy God? Check it out. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. What did they do when they saw the presence of the Lord? Sup, God? We homies. What did they all do, everybody? They got on their face. What vehement a desire. And that word is, I long for any opportunity to pour out with my actions and my words, how deeply, deeply I regret what my sin has caused. What zeal. I'm not grumping, stewing, or begrudging. Sorry. Not that. I'm not grumping, I'm not stewing. I am excited for the opportunity to make it right. And then finally, what vindication. That means to fight strongly for justice. I am committed to exert great energy to protect and defend the ones I have sinned against. You see what these words are? That's biblical repentance. I'm unplanting my flag. It happens between all couples. Sorry, you know. And really, you have planted a flag I think you're being a little unreasonable here. This word says, unreasonable or not, do I have it anywhere in my heart to say, I've really hurt you. I'm going to unplant my, well, that's what you get when you did ABC. I only did what I did because of what you did. That's not what real repentance is. Lord Jesus, my sin has hurt you deeply. I'll do whatever I can to stop making excuses. We're pretty much done here. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll pick up Mr. Simon next week. Can I give you the Reader's Digest condensed version of what he does? He is not repentant. We'll look at that next week. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, messages like this are not easy. They just aren't. But as Nicole and I watched this documentary, well, the documentary was actually about this mega church and how some really important leaders went down to sin. And the world watching outside said, how could this happen, you know? If Harvest, if you and me, if we're not really believing that I personally am capable of doing anything <laughs> at any time. If you don't believe that, you might be an easy target for the enemy's lies. Like Isaiah, like Ezekiel, like Daniel, like John, who wrote the book of Revelation, when they were taken to the presence of the Lord, the first thought that occurred to them was not kumbaya, sloppy agape, isn't God glad I'm here? Every one of them, oh, Lord Jesus, oh, Lord God, Jehovah. Isaiah probably was a pretty great guy in many respects. You know what he said? I am like filthy rags. I am an unclean man with unclean lips. The father dispatches an angel, takes a coal from the altar and touches his lips. Now you are clean Harvest every head down and eye closed for just a minute. I pray that none of you are on video worshiping and praying and getting goosebumps and thinking that you're saved when in fact, perhaps, what if you are not? Steve, stop saying that. You're supposed to assure the people of their salvation. That's not my job. My job is to show you what God's word says. I want to show you a guy who said the sinner's prayer. He got baptized. He sang the songs. But his fruit never changed. You may have taken a thousand communions in your life, but have you really and truly been apprehended by the most powerful concept, I believe, existence in all the universe? What is that? 
that God so loved fallen, sin-saturated, demonically, demonic puppets in some respects, demonically oppressed people. He saw how totally stuck we were in our sins. And he didn't say, come on, you guys. Grab yourselves up by your bootstraps and climb these ladders and jump through these hoops and get to my level. Biblical Christianity is the only deity-human relationship that says humans are hopelessly, helplessly stuck in sin and can never get out. Humans can't fix them and they can't fix themselves. Doesn't matter how many 12-step groups you go to. Have I, have you repented for what your sin has caused him and those around you? I want to take this quick moment. It's very important. Please, every eye closed for just a moment. Holy Spirit, do what you promised you would do. Convict me, convict us of sin. What coping skills have you excused for sin? No, no, you don't see, you don't need to, you don't understand, Steve, I need this. I can't function without it. Nicole showed me another, so awesome, an older pastor. Pastor, pastor, please pray for me, anoint me with oil. I gotta get delivered from the sin. And this pastor said, no one can deliver you from the sin. What? No one can, not even yourself, as long as your sin is your friend. It'll have you. And you've been hoodwinked by some demonic line of reasoning and you are entertaining habitually and consistently some sin. That's why your marriage is a mess. That's why there's no peace. And that's why you come to church time and time again. Harvest, this is our opportunity this morning. Please say to him as he brings it to the forefront of your mind, it's sin. It's sin. It is an abomination. And Lord, I've entertained it too long. The symptoms are difficult marriage, uh, financial challenges perhaps. Who knows what it is? But God has allowed these pinching circumstances not to blow you up, but to finally get you to a place when you're saying, forgive me, Lord Jesus. I have sinned. And like King David, or may, maybe more specifically, the prodigal son, I'm not even worthy. I'll go back and be a servant. I just want to be in the house of the Lord. Holy Spirit, do what you do. Convict us of our sin. Convict us of righteousness. And convict us. Will I be in Christ on judgment day? And if you're not sure you're saved, this is not a guarantee necessarily, but perhaps it's some baby step of faith. Would you lift your hand up and say, Lord Jesus, no more excuses. Getting healed is not taking a magic pill. That's what Simon thought. No more gimmicks and no more gizmos. It's not a church that can turn my life around. It's not a pastor that can turn my life around. It's not a church program that's going to turn my life around. My life gets changed when I stop making excuses for sin. Lord, I want to be truly saved and I want to be completely filled with your Holy Spirit. I need to get into your word every day and I need to consistently revisit 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Save me, Lord Jesus, for my sin and myself. In Jesus' precious name, and now everybody says, amen. 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 <laughs> Amen. If you like some prayer, come up to the front. We'd love to pray with you. And we'll see you on Tuesday night prayer, you guys.